Again, it's great to be with you and to renew some friendships and to see a number of close friends in the audience as well. We have just 15 minutes for this, so I mean, I want to keep it very conversational, so I'm not going to drill down really, really deeply. Probably just give you a few more kind of headlines, which we can kind of hang conversation on. I often try to start these talks with really a, a true story, which I know a number of my colleagues in this room have told and heard. And it just tells a simple story of kind of three kids growing up on this island in the kind of 1960s, 1970s. They were three very normal young boys. Um, two of them went to religious Sunday school together, very, very faithfully. And the other two boys went to what we call primary school together from kind of age four to age 11. One of those boys is now dead. He was shot dead in the back during a internal loyalist paramilitary feud here in the early 1980s. And the second boy served what we call a life sentence for 18 years, uh, for literally almost slitting someone ear to ear and dumping in their body in a back alley quite near where I grew up as a young kid. And I'm the third boy that ends up a Methodist clergy person. And I've often told that story primarily to try to humanise those who were involved in that awful word, terrorism. I've often said to myself and told that story, and I've had 101 interpretations, uh, theological, sociological, philosophical, in relation to it all. When you tell it in religious contexts, particularly in Methodist settings, that wonderful theological phrase comes up, it was provenient grace, which simply means in Methodist terms, God's hand was on you from the day you were born, and that hand obviously stopped you from becoming a paramilitary. I've coined my own phrase, I think it was probably a theology of luck. I remember telling that story at one stage and a guy from Derry came to me who was also going to join the IRA and he said, I actually went to the wrong house. And he said, but the next morning I felt, stuff it, it's not a good idea. And so I think it's just important to kind of hear that context and maybe during the conversation later on we'll talk a little bit about why people do what they did. But the statistic here is that 80% of people that went into paramilitarism would not have been there if they had grown up in Atlanta, Paris, London, Dublin or Glasgow. So there's a context here that made people do very abnormal things. I mean, as Billy Mitchell, the former OC of the UVF in the Mays prison said, in the late 1960s, someone did not fly over Northern Ireland, spray us all with lunatic gas, and all of a sudden we all started killing each other. I would want to suggest there's a context here, and it wasn't just political, and I think sometimes the churches still haven't acknowledged this. We grew up in a very rabid society. This place was really a cockpit of religious sectarianism even though at times the churches don't take ownership of that. And I think when we try to tease out it a little in the global context, what is the role of religion in conflict? Because I think sometimes the last people in the world to own up when things go wrong are people of faith. We'll make excuses, uh, be it over child abuse, be it over religious campaigns, and then eventually when the spotlight turns on it, we finally put our hands up. So I think there's a conversation within religious people globally that need to have what I would call more honest, rigorous discourse when things go wrong that we actually own up to it. So as I mentioned there, I mean, I've spent almost 30 years of my ministry in the inner city, never more than a kind of 100 metres from those interfaces that you saw. I've worked closely with loyalist paramilitaries for almost three decades. I've been involved in negotiations with republicanism, for more or less the same time. But just a couple of things I just want to highlight very briefly because I'm conscious of time. I assume that came up, did it? Yes. Okay, yes. all right, because I can't see it. So I just want to use that phrase initially, toxic religion or transforming religion. Okay, I want to quote Jonathan Sachs, um, whose work around all this is superb. Who here has read Not in God's Name? Okay, those of you who haven't get it, it is an absolute masterpiece. But Sachs says this, on one point, and it is a substantial one, the critics of religion are right. 
Religion has done harm, it has led to crusades, jihads, inquisitions and pogroms. It has shed the blood of human sacrifice in the name of high ideals. People have hated in the name of the God of love, practiced cruelty in the name of the God of compassion, waged war in the name of the God of peace, and killed in the name of the God of life. These are undeniable facts and they are terrifying. And then Sachs suggests that happens not because religion is religion, but because human beings are human beings. And then he says something I like all of us in this room need to hear, religion is power. So all of us in this room today do have a lot of power as religious leaders at our fingertips. Sachs says religion bonds people as a group, it moves people to act, it changes lives. But then he says whatever has power can be used, misused and abused. And he suggests religion is like fire. It warms, but it also burns, and we are the guardians of that flame. So I think that last phrase is very profound for all of us. We in this room are the guardians of that flame. I often look at the Holocaust, and I know it's been mentioned, and I, I say unashamedly that I do agree with many Jewish theologians who place the roots of the Holocaust at the door of the Christian church. There's a Jewish scholar, Gabriel Walensky, who's written a book with a very evocative title called Six Million Crucifixions, in which he argues very strongly that what you and I would call religious anti-Semitism, which was always alive and well on planet Earth and fostered and fertilized by the Christian church, Hitler very cleverly took that and made it racial anti-Semitism. And I think in exactly the same way what you and I in our Irish context would call religious sectarianism was used in the same way. If you excuse my language for a moment, but one loyalist paramilitary said to me, Gary, when you were taught Catholics were shit in Sunday school, it was much easier to kill them. So demonizing the other has a profound context. As another loyalist paramilitary said to me, hearing a religious leader whose name I will not say, but whose name you can guess in the early 1970s, he said to me, it actually lit a fire within me. And he went down and he murdered two Catholics. And I said to this person, well, it most certainly was not the fire of the Holy Spirit. I still at times don't hear the church within the Irish context at times taking ownership of some of that stuff. Yeah, one clergy person much older than me said to me, you know, Gary, in the 1950s and 60s, our churches were full, look at them now. And I kind of tongue in cheek said to him, well, your churches may have been full, but uh, Gary Donoghue's generation and Bill Shaw's generation and my generation, the gift the church gave to us was a religious war, a religious conflict. Because I still believe, even though it was a political conflict, I think a lot of the roots of it were watered by the fertile soil of religious sectarianism, and I still think the church has not taken ownership of that. For two years I spent in a working party in sectarianism with uh, Joe Lichty and many others in the early 1990s, and reading that religious sectarianism in the 16th and 17th century, the polemics of the Reformation, as many of us in this room know, were alive and well here in the Irish context in the 50s and in the 60s. Okay, just a couple of quick quotations. Time is racing on there. Let me give you a quotation from a Dutch reform professor in South Africa. He says, reconciliation is no cheap matter. It does not come about by simply papering over deep-seated differences. Reconciliation presupposes confrontation. I think I maybe want to put in another word there, managed confrontation, okay? Mm -hmm. That we need to manage it rather than kind of head on in a sense. But he suggests the fact that we do not get reconciliation, but merely a temporary glossing over of differences. He suggests the running sores of society cannot be healed with the use of a sticking plaster. Reconciliation presupposes an operation, a cutting to the very bone without anaesthetic. The infection is not just on the surface. The abscess of hate, 
mistrust and fear between black and white, nation and nation, rich and poor, has to be slashed open. And so one of my critiques sometimes of us nice religious people in this room, that I think we're too nice and soft around reconciliation. I'm not against ecumenical services, but for me the totality of reconciliation is not uh, hugging a priest or kissing a nun on the side of the face in St Anne's Cathedral in some nice worship service. It's got to drill down deeper than that. So it really is about managed confrontation. It's not about papering over deep-seated differences, which I think sometimes we in the church are pretty skilled and polished at. There needs to be a very honest conversation. So look, I'm racing through this because there's a couple of other things I just want to say. I guess much of my life has been spent, and this was not my phrase, but others' phrases, really acting as a critical friend to those who wanted to pursue violence. And I've often thought that in a Christian context, the kind of Good Samaritan is a kind of foundational narrative for me in relation to that. And if you remember the kind of story of that within that Christian context, the lawyer's interrogation was a, an attempt really to tempt Jesus. When he uses that question, because within the first century, I mean, nationalism was alive and well within the Middle East. And he asked the question of Jesus, who is my neighbor? And he wanted a very designated answer, as probably many of us did growing up here. Because when I grew up here as a kid in the 60s and the 70s, and gradually when the conflict came about, I worked in the assumption my neighbor was the British Protestant Unionist Loyalists. So things haven't changed. So Jesus has asked the question, who is my neighbor? And he turns the question on its head and ends up asking the question, who is being a neighbor? There's an incredibly profound difference. Who is being a neighbor? My three minutes, okay. It's like the way you get that at the end of the match. It comes up on the screen, three minutes. So here we go. I just want to highlight this. I recommend an article that was on a very uh, progressive Jewish website that I saw about a year ago and I've talked about it 101 times in different contexts. And the article's called, just Google it later, and Humiliation is the Root of All Terrorism. Okay? Humiliation is the Root of All Terrorism. It's on the Jewish website called Tukun, if my Hebrew is wrong, I will get a don't hear from the right hand side, it's T-I-K-K-U-N. Humiliation is the root of all terrorism. And the provides they talk about if you humiliate a person, they're going to react. I'm just back to the United States and I was doing some work around uh, racism and sectarianism and it came about through a blog that a professor at Union Theological Seminary, which I think is a Presbyterian seminary, Bill is in the Upper West Side, and he had this amazing phrase where he said, no one in the United States wants to talk about slavery. And I sort of lifted that out and said, hmm, that's a really interesting S word. Let me tell you about my S word. It's called sectarianism. And I said, in my context, no one wanted to talk about sectarianism with the resultant effect we ended up here with a 30 year civil war. I said in my response to this professor, I am not suggesting that America is going to spill towards a civil war, but I am suggesting unless you deal with your legacy, your cities are going to become more segregated and more violent. I wrote that two years ago, and I'm not a prophet by any means, but I watched American society degenerate into a whole mess and morass around racism. And about three weeks ago, I was working with a group of uh, sort of pastors and theologians in the North Georgia Conference, and on the Tuesday evening before, I think, in the city of Milwaukee, I asked them the question, what was different about Milwaukee? None of them were able to respond. And I said, well, let me tell you what was different. As well as civil unrest, the guns were on the street for the first time in the context of what we would have called a, a riot, in a sense. And I said, my concern is when our conflict began here, uh, there weren't a lot of guns about. We had to go to places like Libya, the Middle East, uh, Eastern Europe, and the United States. 
I said, this place, i.e. North America, is awash with guns. And if this goes badly wrong, I will be deeply concerned. The murder of those five police officers in Dallas did it surprise me, not in the slightest. Was it wrong? Most certainly it was. But I perfectly understood why it happened. Because if you continue to humiliate a people and they don't see any alternatives, they're going to respond. So I'm afraid people like uh, Donald Trump and others are wrong. That security is not just the answer. I want to say security is important. If I go out to a restaurant tonight, be it in Paris or Berlin or in London, I want to feel safe. But I do know this, and a colleague of mine, John Gain, and I'll finish with this, who I was on a panel with last year in Maynooth University. He's a very senior figure in the United Nations. He said at the moment there are something like three to five million refugees in southern Lebanon. One million of them are under the age of 10. Now, I'm not a prophet, but let me predict their future. I would imagine many of them will end up members of Hezbollah, or ISIL, because security is not enough. Those one million kids need educated. They need alternatives. So what the West, I think, needs is, by all means, pursue security within reason. But I also think we need a serious policy of education for those in the Middle East to give alternatives to the context that, let's be honest, we are largely responsible for. So look, I have a stop there at one more point, but we'll get around to it. <laughs>